So in this video, we're going to look at the typical recovery loads for a recreational 4x4, and this is all about safety. So it's going to help you decide how big a winch you might need, help you estimate how, what the forces are likely to be like during a typical recovery, and how you might go about reducing those forces, because the less force involved in recovery, the safer it is. So what are the typical recovery loads? Well, it turns out that a lot of organizations have put a lot of effort into figuring out some formula for that. And the US military, and I've got a copy of their manual, has some examples and there's various other manuals which I found as well. And they all say pretty much the same sort of thing. And they all split the recovery load into three, which is loosely gradient, how much of a slope you're pulling up, terrain, what sort of terrain it is, and mire, which is how deeply the vehicle is bogged. So let's take a look at each each of those in turn. Now this graph here shows the force required to pull a vehicle and this is the slope in degrees. And we're going to start off with the idealized formula which is the force equals the sign of the slope by degrees times weight and that's this orange graph over here and you can see that around it, um, with a 2900 kilogram car read that around it gets to about um, 90 degrees here which is obviously pulling completely straight up. Now this purple line here represents a simplified version of that formula which is force over slope in degrees weight over 60 and you can see that that actually works really well up to about 45 degrees um, because it follows it very very closely. Now beyond that point you are going to be out of traction anyway so you can use this as a reasonable approximation for that. It's, this one's much easier to do when you calculate it out in the bush and where it does deviate it actually adds in a little bit of a safety factor once you get to sort of beyond 40 degrees and that, that's a good thing. So what does that look like? Well this is actually a 45 degree angle I've put there and if we've got a 4,000 kilogram car then um, according to the pure formula that's 2828 kilograms um, no rolling resistance and with the purple method it's 3,000 by 60. So it's um, a three ton pull according to one method and 2828 by another one. So pretty close as you can see. But even at 45 degrees, um, that's not 100% of vehicle weight. Now I should say that's not a rolling resistance. That assumes no rolling resistance. You've got to add that on, but you won't find a 45 degree hill pretty much anywhere outside of slick rock and probably not even then um, for very long because you simply run out of tire traction. It's not a power thing. It's simply a tire traction thing. All right, so how does that stack up in theory? Well, I've been out there and I've actually tested some of this stuff. So this hill is 16 degrees, and according to the maths, that should tell us that we need 28% of the vehicle weight. Well, it turned out we needed 35%, but remember that 28% doesn't allow for terrain resistance or rolling resistance, and even on bitumen, you need to probably add about 3 or 4% for that with um, air down tyres, maybe a bit more. So the theory actually stacked up pretty well there once we factor in rolling resistance. Now this hill was um, 20 degrees um, and you might think that's not very steep but when you're actually out there it is a reasonable sort of low range hill. Theory told us 34, it's 42 percent. Again you add rolling resistance into that and that comes out um, pretty much where you would expect. Now terrain, this is um, forget slope now, this is just going through a given type of terrain and all of those manuals, and I won't go through them all in detail, but they come out with figures like for bitumen 4%, grass 13%, sand 30%, clay mud 60%. Now this does depend as to how much the vehicle is bogged, that's mire, we're going to come on to that in a moment, but that gives you an idea of some of the, the figures um, there. So for this 4,000 kilogram vehicle, it's in sand, we're going to use a 30% figure, that's a 1,200 kilogram pull if it's in sand and that obviously will vary a bit depending if it's air down these are these are rough figures so um, mire moving on to that so if we have a vehicle mired to its wheel hubs the manuals tell us that that's going to be about equivalent to the weight of the vehicle to pull so four tons in this case if it's a, if it's a four ton vehicle and if it's up bog, bog to the top of the tires then you could looking at double the weight here which is eight tons now I should say if you get into this situation you have made some pretty poor life choices and you shouldn't be out there alone you should be have a various other vehicles and equipment with you and the first thing you need to do is reduce that recovery load but that just gives you an idea of probably where the maximum would be as well now you're never going to get into a situation like this where you're pulling up a 45 degree hill that's, that's just not going to be the case but that's probably about the biggest load you can put on a vehicle suction mud when it when it's down it's down that deep uh, more than pretty much any hill 
Okay, so how does that stack up? So we bogged a uh, 100 series and um, covered it, and this was without any drive, by the way, so just pulling out in neutral. That required 108% of its weight. The theory said it should be 100%, so again, um, not a million mile miles out there, but it's always good to add a safety factor onto the theory. Now this was an interesting one, it took a Defender 90 weighing 1980 kilograms and uh, it took 810 kilograms to pull it out like that but 1610 like this and so if we dig that out to get that, that takes about five minutes and you can see that it massively reduces the recovery force required. So I'm going to say it again and again, the best thing you can do or one of the best things you can do for a safe recovery is to reduce the recovery load and that means digging out, using max tracks, um, levering cars off ledges, whatever whatever the case may be, do whatever you can to reduce the force required, it's just safer all the way around and less wear and tear on your equipment. So it gives you an idea. So just pulling this vehicle out through all of that sand in neutral, um, 1610, 80% of its weight, which is really the fact we've got to look at. Okay, so then I went out to the bush um, and I decided to do some more testing. I put my vehicle on a real life four wheel drive hill. It was 22 degrees and we know that because um, we measured it. I'm right, going to measure the steepness of this angle, um, hill, so it's there all the way up to the top and it's fairly consistently steep up this bit. So let's see what the good old trusty angle measurer says and I reckon that's reading about 21, 22 degrees there. So let's just take a couple other measurements and we can sort of take an average a bit further down. what that one says yeah about sort of 21 degrees or thereabouts you reckon all right well that's what we'll use so that's the hill and now time to drive up it so i go up there as hard and fast as i reasonably can then from that point i'm just going to winch it This is why we are stuck. You can see the diff is very much making a hole for itself there. And um, yeah, we are well and truly not gonna make it. And in fact, if you look at that wheel, the wheel's actually literally off the ground. And the reason the car isn't going anywhere is because it is stuck on the diff. Okay, and at the front you can see we are well and truly out of ground clearance. Um, that wheel's coming up to a rut, but it's actually out of ground clearance. And this wheel, I think, is pretty much in the air. Um, certainly, there's no there's no real weight on it. So, yeah, I've launched it up the hill a bit, and. Um, it is definitely not going anywhere. So I've rigged a double line pull, whether it's double or single doesn't really matter. The data for the load is being recorded there, as you can see, unfortunately that GoPro failed to work. There's the anchor point, there's the winch. And from this point onwards, I do three winches. I winch up with the car in neutral. Then I do the same again with the car in drive only. And finally, cars in drive but I've got about 1500 revs on it airbats to help the car along and then we can compare the results using the data logged by that load cell you see and see if there's a difference. So here's the results and to explain the graph over here we've got the force in kilograms which is measured by the load cell once every second against the tree. Now the fact that I was on a double line pull is irrespective, it's going to generate the same amount of force on the anchor point whether it's a single, double or triple line pull. And over here we've got time in seconds so then this plots the, the, the graph of force against time. Now I did the three pulls um, and this one is with the vehicle in neutral so literally neutral letting the winch do all the work. You can see it peaked at 2570 with an average of 1560 kilograms. Then I came back down 
the hill and you can see that's here. So there was still tension on the winch rope and that is reflected um, here. And with the drive assist, just had the vehicle in drive, not touching the accelerator at all. And you can see significant reduction, 17, 14 as opposed to 15, 60, 1200 um, average, that's 30% less. So significant um, reduction in force and therefore a significant increase in safety so clearly those people that say you should never ever ever drive and winch um, you are missing out on a significant safety factor here. but there are points when um, i think it is a good idea to drive it in leave the car in neutral and winch um, and then power assist. This is when I had the car in drive and I had 1500 revs on, I was spinning the wheels, actively trying to get up the hill. Greater again, 1500, 780 as you can see, and that was 100% less on average than the original in neutral. So what does that tell us? Well, again, in four-wheel driving, you can't really make very many absolute statements like always drive and winch or never drive and winch. I think if you're in a situation like this, it makes absolute sense to drive and winch, same for thick mud. Um, what you don't want to be doing is overrunning the winch cable that's the first um, issue but if you're in a situation like this or even in thick mud you can tell when the winch load is coming off because you can hear the winch motor start to reduce and at that point you simply reduce the amount of driving you're doing but even if you have the car in drive and do nothing else and that's not really going to overrun the winch cable then you can get you can get a definite uh, reduction in uh, winch load and therefore increase in safety the other point where you'd want to do this is when you what winch in neutral is when you need all of the tyres grip for lateral traction so you want to you know muddy side slope or something like that and you're winching and if you apply any form of braking or drive you're likely to go sideways then you can just leave the vehicle in neutral um, and pull it across and use all of the tyres grip for lateral traction and that's explained in my traction circle video uh, which, I, which I'll link here. So how much force does a 9,500 pound winch produce? Well, 9,500 pounds is around about 4,300 kilograms. So let's work on that as a basis. But we all know that that's not quite what it's going to produce in reality because there's different layers of rope on the drum. Now, what does that mean? Well, if we've got one uh, layer of rope on a drum we've got a gear which kind of looks like this that size to that size and that, that's our lever you want that as small as possible once we put multiple layers on that gear starts to become in effect a higher gear so it's like how much um how f fast can you accelerate in a car in second gear versus third gear so this is in effect going from like um, the power you get in first gear to second gear or maybe second gear, gear to third gear so the more layers that go onto a drum um, with a winch the less in effect pulling force or, or torque um, that you get so on the second layer Warns figures, which I have taken here, go from 4,300 to 3,900 kilograms, so we can work with that to begin with. And then I'm going to take 15% off for uh, poor wiring, the, the winch isn't working perfectly, whatever the case may be. So we'll run with 3,300 kilograms as a figure for a 4,300 winch. I think that's reasonable. Then we're going to put a pulley block on it. So in theory, it actually give us a two to one. It's actually one, one to nine. Now, what I'm going to use here is there's many different ways to winch a uh, to, to rig a winch but we're just going to take the winch line we're going to put it around a pulley be that a snatch block or a conventional pulley and run it back down to the vehicle now that should give us a two to one advantage i.e it should halve the winch power required um, and it should halve the speed of pull and what it will mean is we'll, we'll pull in double the rope for a given distance so for every two meters of rope pulled onto the winch drum you only move one meter forwards now i've done extensive testing on this and i've done a lot more recently and that's about to hit my youtube channel with multi pulley um, pulls and I can tell you that you're not going to get a 1.2 1, to 1 it's more like a 1.9 to 1 um, I think that would be a good working factor um, for a pull of this nature so if we take that 2 to 1 actually call it 1.9 to 1 3300 times 1.9 we come up with 6300 kilograms so that is a figure which I feel any reasonably well maintained 9,500 pound winch should be able to generate for you using just one block. Um, now, if we multiply it out to three, and this, by the way, isn't a triple line pull, this is a, a four line pull, I'm going to go into that into my next video, then we might go up to, to 10,000 um, kilograms, which is starting to get up there in force. And I've done the figures for a 12,000 pound winch, and it comes out, the key one is 8,000. So you're looking at sort of 6,300, 8,000 kilograms, right, tons worth of pull um, with the winch on the front of your recreational four wheel drive. 
So my conclusion here is that if we look at all of the evidence that I have gathered in the field, all of the training manuals I've read from places like militaries and recovery companies, etc. Um, it all points to the fact that 6,300 kilograms is going to be okay for recovery in virtually every situation. The one exception being where you've got your vehicle so far bogged there's mud over the top of the tyres. Now in that case I think you're really looking at you reducing the recovery load and I'd say that's a bit of, bit of an edge case um, and then uh, you're really going to need to look at what equipment you've got because even if you had a 15,000 pound winch you know is the rest of the equipment going to be up to that as well so that's my view you only kind of need just really one pulley 99 percent of the time so some conclusions then the main thing i can say is reduce that recovery load in the case of that defender you saw it only took two minutes with a shovel just to dig all that sand out massive reduction in recovery load i'm going to say it again the less recovery load you have the less force the greater the safety it's as simple as that um, and i think from all the testing I've done and everything I've, I've read, etc., um, the average recreational four-wheel drive load is about 30 to 80% um, of the vehicle's weight, and sometimes 120, and it's going to be a really rare situation. You're going to get up to 200%, and then you're looking at a serious, serious operation. So that means that a 9,500 and certainly a 12,000-pound winch and one block will be fine. I don't think you need to go to a 12,000-pound winch for, for most situations. There are pros and cons of doing that, but I wouldn't you know, necessarily rush out to buy one. You could argue that 12,000 um, pound runs a bit easier. Um, and there's also no need to go complicated with three or four pulleys um, for really recreational winching. And in the next video, or one coming soon, I will go into that and I will show you the friction and I will show you why that's kind of pointless. Um, driving and winching, it is fine, you can do it. Just don't overrun that cable and you can significantly reduce the recovery load. And again, watch for, the, or listen for that winch motor noise to come down and then that's when you can, okay, yeah, the winch is coming off. I'm just gonna ease off the throttle a little bit here. And you know, if you need a super, super heavy pull, then that's getting into really dangerous territory and chances are a lot of the rest of your gear isn't going to be up to it. So I hope you found this video useful. There will be more on this topic um, as I do more research on actual recovery loads, but so this is considered as a bit of a starter. Any questions, drop them in the comments and thanks for watching.